So we'll do a review of the previous lecture where we spoke about softmax, looked at examples of CNN and uh, DRL and, and deep tune networks. And then this, uh, and today, hopefully we're going to be covering TensorFlow very briefly, just to give you an idea as to what homework number four will be about. And we look at two examples of regression and classification. And then we look at, um, you know, I'll just show you several examples, several types of different classification algorithms besides, um, you know, deep neural networks and ANN. And then the question will be, um, how do you decide which is a better algorithm? Okay. And so then we'll talk about metrics, so classification metrics, uh, which will be used for performance evaluation. And this will, this will help you in deciding which algorithm to use. All right. And this will again be useful when you're looking at homework number five, where you actually have uh, a Kaggle-like competition. And hopefully if you're done with all of this, we will start a new topic, which will be on decision trees. And this will be a one of the traditional uh, machine learning algorithms. All right, it will move on from um, artificial neural networks. So uh, these were some of the uh, topics that we covered in the last lecture. Um, this was um, the normalization example using softmax. And then uh, we looked at uh, how to actually calculate the number of parameters in CNN. We looked at different examples of CNN uh, and large scale computation uh, uh, projects such as AlexNet and others. We looked at regularization and early stopping as well as dropout. And then we covered uh, DRL, deep reinforcement learning. And I think there was a typo in this, which I've corrected over here and uploaded it as well. And we looked at how Q values and deep Q networks and DRL can now use uh, neural networks as well. Okay, and so we covered some of these last time. So now let's take a look at what's coming up in the homework number four. So here we'll, um, I'll briefly cover this, but the more detailed um, coverage will be there in the University of Washington lecture, which will be available on YouTube. Uh, which hopefully will not be too long, but about half an hour worth of lectures. So the first example in TensorFlow is that of regression, okay? Now, I hope you understand the difference between uh, regression versus classification, okay? So we perhaps covered this earlier as well, but in regression versus classification, in classification, let's say we had the example of cats and dogs, and we're trying to figure out what's the best way to differentiate between the two classes. In regression, what you're doing is you might have some attribute over here. Uh, let's say this is your uh, SAT scores, all right, for, for IBS students. And over here, there is uh, your predicted um, GPA, okay? Now, given that you have your SAT scores, which you had presumably before you got admitted, uh, we may have some past results, okay? So we may have some results which go something like this, and we see that this is sort of the best fit line, and this line would typically be referred to as a regression line, okay? So this line would be the best fit based on the past data, and it would have been trained, and it would have uh, generally minimized the mean square error, Okay, this is something that we talked about. Uh, one of the better loss equations was mean square error. So if you want to minimize the mean square error, you would look at the error over here, you would square it, and you would minimize the average of those. Okay, and so you would get the best fit line. So this would be an example of linear regression. Now in linear, once you've found the uh, regression line, then if you have some new data, so for example, you have a new set of students who applied to IBA and we have their SAT score. So this was uh, their SAT score over here. Uh, it's not writing very well today. So this is your SAT score at the top, at the bottom over there. All right. And now we want to be able to predict what the GPA is or what would their score be on the IBA test. Okay. So we can use the past train, trained uh, data to be able to compute what the expected score will be. And it may hopefully be uh, a roughly a good fit based on whether the past data was an accurate depiction of 
the, the current set of students. Okay, so this is what regression is. And in regression, basically, you're doing a generally a linear fit. Okay, and you have two sets of numbers and you're trying. To, so it's very different from classification. Okay, in classification, you're trying to differentiate between two different categories. And regression, you're trying to do a best fit. Okay, so here's a regression example. And this will be given to intensive flow. So what you'll have is a bunch of input data. Okay, so this will be what you may refer to as your X data. If you are looking at your, um, at your neural network, this is your X data over here. Um, X data over here, then you have your neural network, and then you have your Y data, okay? And if you are doing classification, you generally have two Y outputs, Y1 and Y2. But if you're doing regression, do you think you need to have two outputs or just a single output? Remember, you're simply trying to you're trying to predict a single number. So the number of outputs in regression would be one. Okay, not not in classification. And by the way, you can also have multi-class classification as well. So you could have you could be trying to do one of ten categories as we saw in one of the early examples. So there you would have ten different outputs. Okay, so here you would have a single output. And let's call it Y. Not sure why the this thing is not working too well today, but uh, this is your X input and this is your single output. Okay. Now the X input is given in terms of different parameters. For example, uh, this is an example where you're trying to predict the miles per gallon, gallon of a bunch of cars. Okay, so you have let's say about 400 different training data given. And these are different values for different cars. And for each car, so for each one of these rows, you have uh, the weight given over here. Uh, you have the number of cylinders in the car. So people who are familiar with cars know what number of cylinders are. It's sort of like the number of the, the size of the, of the engine. Then you have the make of the car, which year was the car the origins, there could be different origins. And then you could have something which is in text, right? So this is the name of the car. So this is a Chevrolet uh, Malibu. In fact, this was my first car in the US, interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, I remember it had eight cylinders, very uh, very uh, heavy on the petrol. So if you have a lot of cylinders, you, you know, it gives you a good pickup, but it uses a lot of uh, petrol. So uh, this is giving you an 18 miles per gallon, all right, which is very low, low, right? So those of you who drive cars know that if you want to get the maximum out of your, your traveling, out of your budget, then you want to have a high mileage, okay? And you want to have something like this. This is probably a smaller car with uh, less cylinders, and it's maybe a newer model as well. So that's why the, the miles per gallon that it gives you is a lot higher than uh, this old car, which was a 70s make. Okay, so now the idea is that based on this data, you need to do a regression analysis and to be able to predict this, not for the given um, training data, but for test data. Okay, so what you will be expected to do is to use uh, the training data and to do something like um, a 2080 mix, in which you take 80% of the data, convert it to for training, use 20% of the data randomly, and use that for testing and then see how well does, does your uh, algorithm predict the test results, okay? Um, so this was the first example. Um, and let's take a look at how um, TensorFlow would actually work with this. So in TensorFlow, you would have some, uh, some data, which is, for example, it would, it would have some initial code, for example, it's defining TensorFlow uh, as it's defining uh, a TensorFlow to be sequential. It's using a sequential model. So a sequential model simply means that the layers are in sequence. Okay, that's all we've studied so far. Uh, then it talks about different types of activations. Uh, so an activation function is imported over here. It's also talking about a dense layer being imported. So dense layer simply means that uh, every uh, neuron in the subsequent layer is connected to every other neuron in the either the, pre the previous layer or the subsequent layer, okay? Then it's using pandas, which is another directory. Um, and then there are different things which are being imported. And there are some 
uh, SK Learn, uh, which is also being imported. You'll probably learn a little bit about some of these when you look at the University of Washington lectures. Uh, so it's defining the model initially as sequential. And then this is where, if you remember, we looked at the example uh, earlier where they were using a different way of actually constructing the, the, the deep neural network. So here it's slightly, the, the syntax is a little different. You're basically taking the model and then you're adding layers, okay? So the first layer that you're adding is another dense layer and it has, um, it's got a parameter 25 over here and then it's got a shape parameter over here and then an activation, okay? So the activation is ReLU. Uh, the shape parameter would be what? So if you, if you know a little bit about Python, uh, if you have an array and if you use a zero or a one, what do you think that depicts for an array? So the index of uh, the zero would tell you the size of the X values and one would tell you the size of the Y values, okay? So in this case, uh, if this is your X data from here to here, uh, what would be uh, the, the, uh, the value for shape one? Eight. It will be, eight. sorry, eight. 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 Can you say that again or without your mask because I can't figure out what you're saying. Eight. Wait, okay. Uh, no, okay. this is the number in, in, this, in that array, the size of that array. So it's not gonna be, it's gonna be a numerical value, okay? So basically, uh, I, perhaps I didn't explain this to you earlier. This is uh, approximately a 400 rows by uh, seven columns, okay? The number of columns is seven, why? Because weight is a column, uh, cylinders is a column, dot, 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 and year is a column, and origins is another column. The name is not gonna be used that simply text value and that's going to be discarded, okay? And sometimes you have to actually clean up your data before you start using it. So that's going to be shown to you in the examples. So it's a, it's a 400 by seven matrix. There are 400 uh, individual data points. And for each one of those data points, for each one of those cards, you have seven X values or seven attributes, okay? So earlier we were typically looking at two attributes like the length and the, and the width or for cats and dogs, we were looking at, you know, different parameters and so on. But here, seven different attributes are being given. So if you try to actually plot this, it would be very difficult. It would be seven dimensional. Okay, so it's very difficult to plot. But um, so what would shape one be? So it's the, the number of rows or the number of columns? So, so shape is a parameter in Python. So if you haven't looked at this before, basically it tells you the shape of the array, okay? So shape zero would give you the number of rows and shape one would give you the number of columns, okay? So uh, uh, hopefully you had, so this would be shape one would be seven. So basically it's saying that the input dimension is going to be seven. Now, does that make sense? Uh, if you think about it, we said that the X is the input that's coming in into your, into your deep neural network and the dimension is being specified over here, okay? And so you're saying that the dimension of the X uh, input is seven, simply because that this, those are the seven attributes which you're feeding in. So if you're simply feeding in two inputs, the, uh, it would have been two, okay? Now 25, uh, what do you think 25 over here indicates? So think about the neural network over here, all right? So what were the things that you had to specify in each one of these, um, in each one of these um, layers? So, the, so the, the depth would be the number of layers, but now you're focusing on one layer, okay? So this is just focusing on one layer, the first layer. So what were the things? So you need to specify the activation that's already been specified as ReLU. You specified the shape, which is sort of the width of the of that particular layer. Okay, so you, you specified the width. Um, now, what else do you need to specify? If you remember, you're doing going through, sorry? What do I mean by the width? So remember in each one of those uh, layers, 
you have, uh, if in a deep neural network, you have a number of layers. Okay, so that would be the depth of the neural network. The width would be the, the, the you know, the, the vertical width. That would be the number of neurons in that particular layer, okay? So the number of neurons, or the number of inputs has been specified as seven, but now the number of, uh, the number of neurons in the subsequent layer, do they have to be equal to the number of inputs? They don't have to be, right? So what do you think this 25 is? This should be the number of neurons in the first hidden layer, okay? So it has, so you basically taken seven inputs and now you've connected it to 25 other neurons in the first layer, okay? So that's how you're defining it. So that's 25, specified the input, the activation layer. Now let's take a look at the second one. So this is now you're adding a sequential layer, okay? And what are you specifying over here? What is 10? The number of neurons in the second layer. So it's slightly smaller. First layer was 25 and the second layer is 10. Now, why is the first layer 25? Why is the second layer 10? This is simply the architecture. You could come up with your own architecture and you could experiment with that, as I said, and see how well that performs. It's somewhat of a you know, trial and error kind of a system, unfortunately. Okay. Sorry? Logic, so as I said, you go back to the X and OR example. Okay. So if you have, if you, if you want, uh, and, and go back to the TensorFlow playground. Okay. Think about all of those examples and you don't want to make it too wide, too wide and you don't want to make it too deep. Why? Because that would be an overkill. So you want to have the minimum, but uh, the minimum which can actually address all the attributes, okay? So if you think that, you know, you could start with some number and then you could play, uh, make it smaller, make it bigger and see how the results. So that's how typically it's done in deep neural network. Okay, as I said, it's an art, it's not a science yet. Maybe another 10 years it'll become some more of a science, but it works. So the next layer is now 10. So, uh, you know, you made it smaller in width. The activation again is value. Now, why do we not need to specify the input dimension in the second layer? We, we only specify the input dimension in the first layer. So speak up a little bit. No, not the depth. So, uh, so the depth is the second layer. This is, a, this is a layer two, so the depth is two. In a sense, this is the depth of the neural network, but the width of it is going to be what? Now remember it's dense. So that means the width, width is going to be the same as the number of neurons in the previous layer, okay? In other words, the, sorry, let me say that again. The number of inputs in the second layer is going to be determined by the number of neurons in the first layer. Okay, so it'll be automatically be 25, exactly. So you don't have to specify it again in the second layer. Similarly, in the third layer, uh, in the third layer again, um, it's not specifying the number of inputs. Now it's only specifying that it's a dense layer. And now why do you think uh, it's, it's got an, um, one specified over here? Because it's the output and this is regression. So the output is only going to be one single value, okay? So this sort of explains the, the regression uh, deep neural network as in this particular example, okay? Now, the next thing that happens is that you need to compile it. And in this statement, you specify generally two parameters. You specify the optimization criteria. Now, we didn't really go over this, okay? And there's a very popular optimization criteria, which is called ADAM. So just live with that for, for, the, for the time being. And you know, in the a, in a whole course on this, you would go into that. However, uh, mean squared error is kind of obvious. So in a loss where you're doing regression, as I said, in the regression type, you, would, you could use a, a mean squared error, all right? That's what hopefully you've, you've seen that in some maybe course earlier in a calculus course or something. Do you do regression at all in any course in calculus? Yes, one person is nodding. So I think the rest of you are still remembering whether it was done or not. Okay, but I'm trusting you that it's done. So um, in the last uh, co uh, code, 
It's basically now doing the actual fit. Okay, so this is going to be uh, doing the training. So here basically you're saying you're giving it the inputs X. Now, why is, is X known and is Y known? Are both of them known or one of them is, one of them is known and the other is unknown? Sorry? Why is Y known to us? No, Y is not known, right? So Y will be calculated based on the neural network. So Y is not a parameter that, um, that, you, that will be uh, provided. However, uh, Y over here, the, for the training data, Y will be given. Okay, for the, let's say if you're training it on 80% of the data, so about out of 400, let's say 350 uh, data points will be given in terms of Y. And for those, the X and Y values will be given. So this will be the training data. So for all these, let's say 350 training points, here are the labels which are given as Y, okay? Now it will of course calculate it and it will try to do uh, a, a gradient descent algorithm and back propagation and all of that and try to come up with the best weights so that uh, it can actually do future uh, good predictions. Uh, now epochs, um, what do you think epochs imply? Epoch, the word is an English term, right? It simply means the amount of time, all right? So epochs is simply uh, specifying the number of iterations that you're going to do, okay? So in each iteration, you're going to train all of the weights, okay? Uh, so, so imagine that how many weights are there going to be roughly? So in the first layer, there are 25 um, neurons, and then the next layer, there are 10 neurons. But remember, the number of weights is going to be a lot more because for the second layer, the number of weights are going to be 10 times 25, okay? So the number of weights are going to be, you know, several hundred, if not thousands. And uh, for each one of these epochs is going to train the, all the weights and it's going to keep on repeating it. The number of weights in the first layer will be how many? Sorry, speak up a little bit, I can't hear you. 400, um, it'll be 20, cal do the calculation, it'll be 25 times, times what? The number of inputs. And the number of inputs are seven, okay? So it'll be seven times 25, whatever the number is, okay? And the second one, and in the last layer, how many weights are they going to be? It's a single output and it's connected to 10 previous neurons. So they're going to be 10 neurons. Actually one more for the, for the uh, bias. So there's going to be 11 neurons. Okay, so, um, and so when you say verbose over here, what that tells you is that in every iteration, it's going to tell you all the results. Okay, so it's going to tell you how good is the performance, how good are the metrics being. Now, what are the metrics? We haven't talked about that. That's one of the things I'm gonna talk about today is how do you actually determine how good is the algorithm? Okay, and so we'll talk about that as we go forward. So this was regression. Now let's take a look at the next example, which is that of classification. And this is a very famous example, which is often uh, cited in uh, machine learning. And this is an example of a, an iris data, okay, an iris data set. Now the previous was somewhat fictitious, all right? Uh, it wasn't complete, it wasn't really fictitious in the sense that this was actual data based on real cars, okay? But it was only 400 data points. So it wasn't very useful. However, in the Iris data set, this is an actual data set and this is based on flowers. Okay, so Iris is a type of flower. It's um, I think four leaf clover, or three leaf clover, something like that. And it basically, they try to classify it into one of three categories. Okay, so this is Iris setosa is the first category. There's another category and then there's Iris virginica, something like that, okay? So they're trying to, and what they've done, this is probably some bot botanist who actually did this experiment. They collected thousands of data, thousands of uh, flowers, and they looked at different uh, features. So now, because they're looking at these flowers, they're looking at these features, which are the, um, you know, the, the petals and the sepals. If you remember what a petal and a sepal is, uh, you remember this diagram from one of your, biology classes, uh, which you did hopefully in ninth grade or something, you have a flower and this is your sepal, which is the leaves in the flower. And this is, uh, sorry, this is the petal and this is the sepal, 
Okay, I'm getting confused. Well, it's long. It's been a long time since I studied biology. Okay, but anyway, sepals have a different feature, and petals have different features. Okay, so sepals, um, the the length of sepals and the width of sepals are being given over here. Okay, so this is the length of a sepal, and this is the width of a sepal, and this is the length of a petal, and this is the width of a petal. Okay, so I think the petals are, well, one of them is actually the the base leaves and the other one is the one in the actual flower okay something like that anyway so all of these are being used to be able to categorize them into one of three types of flowers okay and this is an actual data set so uh, you can actually if you train this properly you can get fairly good accuracy in terms of being able to predict if you get a new flower and you don't you're not sure uh, what category it is you can specify the you can just measure the length and width of the petals and the sepals and then if you feed this in into this data set, into this, uh, algo, into this engine, it should be able to tell you with a certain probability that which of the three categories is the flower in, okay? So uh, let's take a look at how TensorFlow works in this case. So this is sort of sim similar. Uh, it's going to have a sequential model, okay? Uh, it's going to, we're going to use act uh, ReLU activations. The input uh, dimension is going to be based on shape one. Now, uh, let's see how many, uh, what should shape one be in this case? Four, yeah, it should be four. Why? Because four features are being specified, right? These are the four features over here. Um, and then uh, the, the first layer has a 50 specified over here. What do you think this is? This is the number of neurons in the first layer. So it has a width of 50, okay? Then a second layer is being used. It has a width of 25. They've used different widths as well. Okay, uh, the activation against again is ReLU. And now uh, the third layer um, is specifying, um, is, is doing something a little different and it's basically using a soft max, okay? Now, um, what is softmax? Uh, remember, if we, we discussed this briefly in the in the previous in one of the previous lectures, softmax is basically allows you to normalize the data in order to get a distribution. Now, in this case, how many outputs should we expect? We try to classify it into one of how many categories? One of three categories, right? Three different flowers. All right, three outputs. So we should expect three possible outputs: y1, y2, y3. Okay, and what softmax basically does is it takes numbers and it will convert it into a probability distribution. And remember what it does. We, we went over this last time, right? It sort of stretches, stretches the results such that the one which is slightly higher comes out to be very prominent. Okay, so if you don't remember, just revise that. Okay. Um, and and we move this over here. Now the compile statement over here uses an optimization, which is the same as before, which is Adam. Okay. However, the loss is different. Now, what was the loss in the previous case? It was mean squared error, right? Now here it is something called categor categorical cross entropy. Now it's quite a mouthful. And what it, what it means, we'll, let's talk a little bit about that, okay? And then the last line is, is the same. Let me just see if I can move this over here. The last line is still the same. So you're going to take, you're going to give it X and Y data, and this is going to be used for training. A verbos two and epochs, you're going to use 100 epochs. Verbos simply specifies what kind of output you need. So verbos zero will say, I'm not going to get any output for each one of the epochs. Okay, verbos two means give me the maximum so that I can actually see how the output is getting better and better. Okay, so it'll, it'll look at things like accuracy and so on, which we'll talk about later. So now let's try to understand what categorical cross entropy is. And I'm, and I'm not going to go through it in too much detail because it can become quite mathematical, but let me just give you a very brief idea. Okay, now remember when you're doing mean square error, uh, you're doing this calculation, right? You're taking the label y hat and you're taking the y output. You, come, you 
uh, uh, subtracting the two, taking the difference and you're squaring it, and then you're summing it over all, all the outputs, right? This is what you do in mean squared error. So can somebody tell me what the mean squared error here is in this example? Let's say you only have two outputs and you're trying to classify a, a dog versus cat. Your actual output is 0.2, and this was supposed to be a cat, which was labeled as zero. Uh, the actual output was supposed to be a one in this case, which was a dog, but the, act, but the actual output comes out to be 0.8. The label is supposed to be one, and the actual output is 0.8. So what's the mean squared error? 0.2 squared plus, plus 0.2 squared, good. Why? Because it's uh, one minus 0.8, squared over here okay and this is zero minus 0.2 squared over here okay so this is what uh, the mean squared error would come out to be now mean squared error can be used in classification but mathematicians have found that uh, you can actually use a better algorithm and this is referred to as categorical cross entropy or cce okay now it uses something called entropies and so on, which I'm not going to get into, uh, but basically the, here's the equation. This is all that you need to know right now. It uses the log of what? Of the, of the, of the output or of the labels? This is the, the actual output, okay? And it multiplies it with what? With the actual labels, okay? So it's taking the label and it's multiplying it with the log of the actual output, okay? So let's now try to calculate what the CCE would be in this case. So it would be minus, why is it minus? Because when you take a log of a number which is less than one, it comes out to be negative, okay? So you have to convert into positive number. So uh, tell me what the answer should be. If you're going to take it for the two cases, I is going from zero to one because you only have two rows. Uh, what's the first label for cats? What's the value of y hat? Zero times log of 0 0.2 plus one times the natural log of 0 0.8, okay? So that is fairly straightforward. So that's all we're doing. So we're doing a different, we're doing a different mathematical operation to be able to calculate the loss, okay? Now you might ask why we do that. So just to show you the results, uh, the natural, the mean square error was 0 0.08 and the categorical cross entropy was higher, okay? Now, um, let's take a look at the following example. And this sort of just sort of gives you an idea of what the difference is. So here's another example. This is a multi-class categorization, multi-class uh, classification. So here you're trying to classify between one of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different categories of animals, okay? And this is from this example, by the way. So if you want to take a close look at this, you can look at this YouTube video. And here, this input, this particular row is that of a red panda. So the label is 100% over here. The rest of them are all zeros. In other words, it's not a cow, it's not a fox and so on, but it's a red panda, which looks something like this. And um, the... So if you wanted to calculate the, for this particular uh, data point, you wanted to calculate the uh, mean squared error versus the um, cross entropy, how would you do it? Well, uh, if you did the mean squared error, how would you do it? You take each one of these points. So you take P minus Q, which means the, the label minus the actual value, right? Now the label over here was zero but the actual categorization came out to be 0 0.02 or 2%, okay? So it's not doing a perfect job. Uh, it, it did give 25% for red panda, but it gave something else, 45% for a fox, okay? So it's not doing a very good job right now. So let's see what the mean squared error would be. It would be um, zero over here for the first case. Um, okay, why? Because it's taking zero minus, I'm not sure why it's 0, 0 0.0, maybe it's so small. But anyway, you can calculate these and you can find out that the mean squared error comes out to be 0.821. The cross entropy comes out to be 1.3, it's larger. Now the cross entropy, it will be simpler because it will simply take these values. So it will be taking the, if you look at the equation over here, 
is taking the y hat, okay? Now the y hats in all of these are going to be zero, okay? There's only one of them which is non-zero, which is the true label, okay? So you're simply taking y hat and you're multiplying it by the natural log of 25%. So this is what you get uh, over here and you'll get cross entropy of 1.3. So what do these numbers mean? Okay, so if you try to plot these, you can sort of get an idea as to what, just like in the previous case, softmax was sort of stretching some cases and trying to differentiate between the ones which were larger. Here, uh, the cross entropy is also doing something similar. So mean squared error, for example, if it's a very poor case, okay? So in this case, um, what we're basically doing is it's a very bad um, uh, algorithm and it's not doing a very good differentiation. Over here, the mean squared error only gives you a value of two. In other words, the, the error is not very large. But when you do cross entropy, it gives you a much larger error, okay? So this is why it's useful. It's, it's sort of, you can see it's fairly similar to an MSC, but in some cases, it sort of exaggerates the loss, okay? And that comes out to be very useful, all right? So this was just a little bit of a, a background for you so that you know what uh, some of these algorithms are actually using. Okay, so categorical cross entropy, once again, is going to be used every time you're doing classification. And you'll see this quite often whenever you're doing classification. And when you're doing regression, you will see mean squared error. Okay. So, um, so that finishes that uh, review of the homework, just to give you an idea as to what you're going to be expecting in the homework assignment, okay? It's not actually very difficult and that's why we made it only four points. Uh, basically, I'm going to actually give you the code, okay? The real challenge is going to be that you want to be able to create the actual data. So you're going to be, uh, you, I'm going to give you an example of what kind of data you're going to make. So I've given you examples of X's and O's which I've hand drawn, okay? So you give, let's say 20 X's, 20 O's, which sort of says that the data set is balanced, okay? You can create your own data set. You can create it from, for example, if you have a couple of friends and you want to be able to classify them, so take friend A and friend B. So take 20 pictures of friend A and 20 pictures of friend B, or it could be your enemies or whatever, all right? And just uh, see if you can take that data set and whether your algorithm as is was actually able to, based on the training, was actually able to correctly classify your some new data which was the test data okay so this would be interesting hopefully for you so um and this should actually give you an exposure of how to do this now one of the things that i'm also asking you to do in the homework assignment is that you i'm going to expose you to something called google collabs i don't know if i mentioned this earlier uh, so google collab basically is an online uh, system which is made available by by, by google and uh, what it basically means that you don't have to install uh, TensorFlow or Python uh, or any of the other libraries on your computer. Now that's normally a very, fairly painstaking task, okay? And it takes a fair amount of time. And then it uses your own computer's GPU or CPU, okay? GPUs, as you know, are graphical processing units, which are very heavily used in, in all deep neural networks. Now, if you don't have a very good uh, machine, then, and if you don't want to go over all the process of actually installing TensorFlow, then basically what Google has done is made it available to you online, free of cost, okay? So this is quite amazing. And they give you GPUs as well, which are normally fairly expensive. So if you go onto any cloud service provider like Amazon or others, they'll actually charge you quite a bit for being able to do processing on their systems, okay? And the cost comes out to be thousands of dollars if you're doing a lot of good work. Now this is made available to you free, but of course it's you know some limited amount of data, okay? Some limited amount of resources. But uh, we, if you do the homework assignment, you will learn how to take data, upload it onto your Google Drive, and then uh, you must have a Gmail account, of course, and then to be able to use Colab, to be able to use TensorFlow. And then this can be actually used in the next homework assignment where uh, you will actually be doing a real competition, okay? So now let's go on. Uh, now we're going to move away from neural networks for a while, probably for the next three lectures, uh, the remaining lectures. And let's take, we'll take a look at some of these other algorithms. So I'm going to try to look at uh, decision trees first, 
And then there's a whole bunch of other algorithms that you should be familiar with, or at least should have heard their names, like random forest, which is based on decision trees. There's something called logistic regression, uh, which is only for binary, uh, which is very similar to the softmax thing that we looked at. Uh, K, nearest near, uh, K nearest neighbor algorithm, support vector machines, naive Bayes, and so on, okay? Now, one of the basic questions that you would need to ask yourself is that you have all of these algorithms, right? And you have a certain amount of data, a data set that you want to be able to classify. Now, the first question would be, which algorithm is actually better, okay? And so in order to be able to differentiate between different, uh, different algorithms, what you clearly need to be able to do is have metrics to be able to defy, decide whether is this algorithm better or the other algorithm better, right? So what are metrics? Metrics are simply an evaluation tool. For example, how do we decide which is the best student at IBM or in universities? We have the metrics called CGPAs, right? Do CGPAs always work very well? Not necessarily, right? So somebody who has a 4.0 CGPA when they go out in the industry, do they necessarily always get the highest job offer? Not necessarily. So it depends a lot of on other categories. So it depends on what metric you use. So if you're simply going to use CGPA, it may not be the best way. Now, if IBA is simply using CGPA to evaluate our students, it's not very good, okay? So what should IBA use? <laughs> learning rate, that's very good. So a learning rate, uh, interesting thought. Ideally, in a good university, what you should look at is measure a student's sort of, uh, you know, ability or knowledge or, um, you know, the IQ or what have you at the beginning. And then as you're saying, their learning rate. So in the, after one year, how is the student progressing? And what is the value addition from IBA, right? So if IBA is taking excellent students and making them excellent, that's not really much of an achievement, right? But if you're taking really poor students and converting them into them into uh, excellent students, then actually that's the value of IBA. Okay. Yeah. So, but every university wants to actually they want to generate an output which is very good, right? So they're already biased. They what they do is they try to get the best students and then they try to make them not so best. <laughs> uh, yeah. So there is a great deal of bias, but. Unfortunately, that's how education works. You know, every schooling system works the same way. Every university works the same way. Although in the future, you know, people like, uh, you know, there are a lot of educationists which are trying to democratize education. In other words, they would like to provide equal opportunity to every student in the world, right? And that hopefully through MOOCs and other online uh, platforms, that should be possible. So you make the platform from let's say MIT or Harvard, make it available to every single person, and then let them, you know, have get let them have equal access, and then let them, you know, improve themselves. But anyway, so coming back to the metrics, so if you simply use CGPA, that may not be the best way. Uh, we could use other metrics, but unfortunately, it's very difficult to use other metrics. Uh, the other metrics that we use is, you know, how many societies you're taking part in. Are you in? Are you in the? You know, are you president of any society, or are you vice president, and so on? Even that is not very useful, but those are additional things. Are you taking part in other uh, extracurricular activities and so on? So here again, we'll also see similar issues that we may choose an initial metric, which may not be very good, okay? So let's take a look at uh, an initial example. And this is an example of a classification. And um, in this case, what we're trying to do is we're trying to classify between rectangles and triangles. Okay, very simple. Uh, we've got how many triangle, how many rectangles? We've got a total of six rectangles, and we've got a total of four triangles. So, is it a balanced data set? It's not exactly balanced. It's slightly imbalanced because the number of the both the categories is not equally present. Okay, if they were exactly equally present, you would say it's a balanced data set. Now. Um, what we need to decide, for example, if you remember when we, when we had the case of cats and dogs, uh, we would have a, a partition line, which would basically differentiate between the two categories, okay? So this, is, this can be called as the decision threshold. So let's say we, our initial decision threshold comes out to be this, and these could be, you know, the vertical and horizontal axis could be whatever, you know, it could be one feature versus another feature. So we're looking at two features in this example. 
because as you can see, the triangles and rectangles are placed in a two-dimensional space. So we're simply looking at two features. Now, um, let's say if this is our decision threshold, uh, now let's use a particular uh, metric and we'll call that metric accuracy, okay? So accuracy over here simply means that we're going to take what are called true positives and true negatives, and we're going to divide it by the total. Now, what do we mean by true positives and true negatives, okay? So, so true positives, uh, so let's say we're trying to predict rectangles. So we're now focused on rectangles, not on triangles, okay? So true positive simply means that if you use this decision threshold, how many rectangles are being correctly classified, okay? So clearly the number of true positives is four, right? Because we have four rectangles which are being correctly classified. Similarly, the number of um, for, uh, true negatives, which are, uh, which are the number of rectangles which have um, been Sorry, this is, the, this is the number of triangles which have been correctly classified. So they're true, but they're negatives, right? Positive simply means that it's a, it's a rectangle. A negative simply means that it is a triangle, okay? So the number of true negatives is simply the number of triangles which have been correctly classified, okay? So that's three. The number of false positives, so the number of false positives basically says that now we're classifying a triangle as a positive case. And that's clearly false because it is not a rectangle. So the false positives in this case is one. And the false negatives is how many? That's basically saying that we have uh, classified these two inaccurately and we've classified them as a negative case because they're being classified as triangles, okay? So, sorry? Yeah, so false positives is true, is only two in this case. Why is that? Uh, false positives, false positive is over here. Sorry? Right. A cl classification, okay? So when you're saying a positive, it means it's been classified as the positive case, which is the rectangle, okay? So false positive basically says that we thought that this is a positive case, but it's actually false. And it's actually a triangle which was classified as a positive case, okay? So I hope that's clear, all right? So um, now if you use accuracy, it basically case takes all the correctly classified cases and divides it by the total number of cases, okay? So how many correctly, case, how many correctly classified cases are there? There are seven because four rectangles have been correctly classified and three triangles have been correctly classified. So the accuracy is seven divided by the total number of data points that we had was 10. Okay, we had five over here and five over here. Okay, so I hope this is clear. So this is accuracy. Now, suppose that we had an imbalanced data set. Okay, so here's an imbalanced data set. And let's say that the number of rectangle, the number of rectangles are extremely large. I haven't drawn all of them, but let's say there are a hundred rectangles. Okay, and there are still only four triangles. Okay, now what if we use a, a decision threshold, which simply says that I'm going to classify everything as a rectangle, okay? Sort of, uh, sort of makes sense because, you know, the vast majority of, of the population is all rectangles, okay? So maybe if you want to have a good accuracy, we could say, well, let's just forget about the triangles and uh, we, if we classify all of them as rectangles, then as it is, we're going to have about 100 of them correctly classified. And only four of them will be incorrectly classified. So the accuracy will be very good, right? So the accuracy will be 100. This is the true positives and true negatives are zero. Why? Because there's nothing being classified in, in, this, in this side, okay? So true negatives are zero. So 100 divided by 104, 
which is saying there is a way there is a 96 percent probability that you will uh, anything that you classify is going to be correctly classified okay but is this good or not it's clearly not good from it's good from the rectangles point of view but from the triangles point of view it's pathetic okay why because you've actually misclassified each and every triangle okay so this is like having a metric which is good in some cases it's good if you have a balanced data set all right it works very well but if you have an imbalanced data set then it works very poorly okay so now the question is can we come up with better metrics okay so it's like like saying cgpas are not very good metrics let's try to come up with better metrics to evaluate students okay do an oral exam for every student okay sorry online is that a good metric pathetic metric <laughs> all right that's my personal opinion um and that's actually the fa the the current failure of the online system and if we can if universities can actually overcome this challenge then online systems will survive otherwise uh, unfortunately they're not doing very well because simply because online exams are not very good metrics okay you know in some universities uh, my son is at hong kong university used to be and over there what they do and i'm thinking about this in the future they actually have very tough requirements and they say that every student must have two cameras on one would be the the camera on the and the laptop another camera on the mobile phone which should be placed in such a way that you can actually see the person so that you can actually see who else is around there you know the environment so there's nobody who's right standing right next to you and helping you uh they um they don't require mics to be turned on but guess what one of the fip groups that i'm currently supervising they came up with this idea it's not my idea they said let's come up let's try to come up for the fip an algorithm which can help us try to reduce the the you know try to come up with a better online examination system so what they're working on this is just an idea right now they're working on a proposal in which one or two cameras can can be made can be used plus they would also use mics okay so in zoom right now if you use mics then obviously everybody gets disturbed but what they're do, trying to do is develop a separate system which would add on to the lms and where you'd have to log in and then everybody's mic will also be turned on they won't hear each other but your mic recording would be used to be able to determine whether you're talking to somebody else or not okay and in addition they're planning to do this this is still an idea that they're going to have data about the browsers so if it's not an open open test open uh, book exam then they will also monitor whether you're actually looking at you know wikipedia or other favorite websites or not okay so those would be uh, perhaps coming in in the future if, if their algorithm works you see that's what you think but uh, covid has actually changed the world all right I won't be surprised if you know faculty members and students after a few years say, well, you know, online education is working so well. Why do we need to come on campus? Why do we need to have this big auditorium when we can do you know education? I mean, majority of the students are doing online education, right? And if they feel that you know they can get as much out of the course online, and if the teacher is able to teach as well online. Then why do we actually have to come on campus? Okay, but there is a difference. Obviously, when I can see you, I can talk to you. You can actually ask me questions. People online actually miss out on this interactive part. Okay, so there is still a difference. But you know, everything has a certain cost and a certain value. So coming back to the metric, so can we think of a better metric? Okay, that will that can be able to differentiate between these two. So now, let me ask you: Can you think of a better metric which is better than accuracy? Okay, how else could we actually try to figure out? Uh, so remember, what what is accuracy doing? It's taking the true positives plus the true. Uh, if you look at these two cases, so you have true positives, false po positives, so true positives, false positives, true negatives. Sorry, uh, false negatives, false negatives and true negatives okay so let's try to see uh, what should be the number over here true positives would be how many 100 true negatives would be zero over here what would be the number of false positives and what would be the number of false negatives over here now what are false positives false positive is this case all right so will it be one over here 
false positives. Remember the decision has decision threshold is changed. It's over here. So yeah, so it'll be four. All of those four triangles have actually been considered as a positive, but they're false. Okay, so all four uh, triangles are, and how many false negatives? Zero, because there's no, there's nothing in this. The everything has been classified as a rectangle. So these two are are zero. So now, if you want to come up with a better criteria, can you suggest a better criteria? What should it involve? Sorry, equal weightage of what? So you're coming, we're trying to come up with a metric, all right? And basically what we're saying is, okay, what's happened is that this decision threshold is a not a good threshold, right? But we, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find a metric which can tell us that this decision threshold is not good, right? We're trying to find a metric. We're not trying to change the threshold. We're trying to find a metric. What this metric is doing is it saying that the accuracy is very good? This saying, fantastic, we don't have to change anything. So what we're trying to do is find for the same threshold, we're trying to find a better metric. So what should be a better metric? What should it involve? Sorry? Okay, so changing the decision threshold is sort of changing. Uh, it's like changing the student, okay? We're not trying to change the student. Here's a bad student. Now the metric is saying he's a really good student, he or she, okay? Generally it's a he, okay? girls do better. So, uh, so here is a boy and we're finding out that he, he's showing to be really good, but in fact, he's not very good. He's showing that his CGP is 96%, whereas in fact, he is not really doing very well. So what you're saying is I changed the boy into a girl who's perhaps better, but no, let's not do that. You know, there was a time, this is a kind of a joke. Um, girls do so well, in, in all universities, especially in countries like Pakistan. I remember there was, a, and most gold medalists are girls. There was a time when seven, there were seven gold medalists at IBA. This is an actual case. And six of them were girls and one was a boy. And when the prospectus came out, when the announcement came up, the guy who actually did the typesetting, he wrote miss in front of the boy as well. So that is an example of misclassification, right? Because it's exactly like this. You've actually taken the example because there are so many girls who are getting gold medals, you've classified everybody as a female, okay? Uh -huh, exactly, so what we're trying to do is find a better metric. So in the previous case, the metric was only looking at true positive and true negative and it was dividing by the total. Now, what, what do you need to do? You need to come up with a better metric and you can see that true positive could be useful, but somehow um, true positive plus true negative is not good enough because this is a very good number. You should use maybe some of the other parameters which are all which are sort of being neglected over here. What is being neglected over here? The false positives and the false negative is being totally neglected, okay? So in order to be able to come up with a better metric, you need to be able to come up with a matrix which actually involve the false positives and false negatives, okay? So, yeah. Okay, that is, again, that's like changing the, the person who's being evaluated, okay? We're not trying to change that. All we're trying to do is we're trying to say, this is a given threshold. It's not doing a good job, but I would like the metric the CGPA to tell me that this person is doing badly, okay? So the decision threshold is like sort of the individual that is being evaluated, okay? That's the, that's the scenario that's being evaluated. And now you need to be able to have an evaluation technique which says that this, this person is not doing well. This evaluation technique is, doing, is not doing well, okay? So that's why we need to have additional metrics, okay? So let's look at additional metrics. So here's an additional metric, which is called precision. I'm going to take a few more minutes if it's okay with everybody. So uh, the precision metrics takes a look at true positives, okay? And it basically, here's the concept behind precision. It basically says what you're saying as positive should actually be positive, okay? So if you're saying that, and so you're not going to look at the negative side. So you're only going to look at 
those things which have been classified as rectangles. Okay. Now what you want to be able to see is how accurately are, are those guys categorized, which have been categorized as positive, how many of those are actually positive? Okay. So that's simply going to say, let's take the true positives and I'm going to divide it by true positive plus the false positive. Okay. So this comes out to be four upon five, which is 80%. So this is one criteria and this is only going to look at those which have been categorized as positive. Okay. So this is called precision. Yeah. So good point. So what you're saying is that uh, in this case, if you, if you did the accuracy uh, and we look at the results as well, but let me just define the, the two metrics and then we'll come and take a look at how they perform. So this is the precision uh, metric and we'll later on decide whether it works out well or not, okay? The, um, the other metric is called recall, okay? So recall says that it ensures you are not missing out on positive observations, okay? So basically now it's going to forget about the triangles. Right now, it's going to say how were the rectangles classified? Did we miss out on some rectangles which were misclassified as false, whereas in fact they were true? They were they should be classified as as rectangles. So we're only going to look at the rectangles over here. You notice that I've removed all the triangles. So now the recall, which is also called sensitivity, by the way, sensitivity, and this is used. These parameters are used very heavily. My son was a doctor. He says he knows these parameters, although they never studied an iota of engineering or computer science, but they know about sensitivity because this is used in medical sciences a lot, okay? So, um, so recall basically says that you take all the true positives and you divide it by the true positive and the false negative. So earlier we were dividing it by the false positive here, all right? But here now we're dividing it by the false negatives because we're just focusing on all the rectangles and whether they were classified correctly or not. Okay. So you get certain percentages over here. So now that you've understood uh, the two cases, let's try to just do this calculation and see uh, how this is this working out. So let's do the, we've done the, the precision and recall for the, for this case, let's, let's apply it over here for the triangles. So can somebody tell me what this would be? Precision for triangles, just look at it. Uh, precision is basically saying that uh, of those who have been categorized as negative, what proportion of them have been correctly classified? So it's only looking at the triangle side. So what should it be? It should be three upon five, right? Uh, now recall over here should be uh, should be now it's looking at all the triangles. Okay, so what should this be? Three upon four. So if you're able to correctly identify this, you can now see that you understand the logic behind these two algorithms. Okay, so this is three upon five, and this is uh, four upon five. Okay, now let's try take a look at whether your question whether in the case where the rectangles are, it's extremely unbalanced and we'll stop after this, whether when you try to do the precision and recall for the triangles, whether it does it correctly or not. Okay, so what would this be over here now? So basically precision is saying, what proportion of the triangles were correctly classified? So what proportion of the triangles were correctly classified? Zero, and what's the total number that were classified as triangles? is also zero, right? So what is zero upon zero? <laughs> That's a interesting math equation because this is undefined, right? But actually let's just call it a zero. Okay, let's forget about this. So it's basically coming up, it's, the precision is 0%, okay? So it's completely uh, incorrectly uh, doing the precision. Now what, uh, and we know that um, it should have been something different. Now, what about uh, recall? So, um, how is recall doing? Recall is basically saying that, now let's take a look at all the triangles and see what proportion of them were correctly classified. So again, how much? what is this going to be? Zero upon, so how many of, of them were incorrectly classified? Zero. And how many of them were correctly classified? Uh, well, correctly classified was zero and incorrectly classified were 
for. So this is also 0%. So as you can see now, precision and recall are now telling you that here's the true face of the student he is doing pathetic, all right? So night precision was, uh, this other case was very good, but here it's really bad, okay? Now I'll stop over here and we look at this next time. What if we change this and we, and we look at, there's certain trade-offs between precision and recall, but uh, we look at this next time.